Thank you all for your attention. I would now like to present a short video of ACCA's mission, impact, and journey over the years. we have is the pace of change and the degree of adoption of change. What is the implication on ethics? What is the implication on business? We can't just continue to operate as we've done for the past 20 years. If we don't change now, then it's too late. The ACCA has led the world in opening up opportunities to professional life, but we never rest on our laurels and there is more and more to do. The issues that we see playing out around the world is a function of significant increases in inequality. What we need to do is ask policymakers to take a much more longer term view, particularly in terms of education, health care, and infrastructure. That call to action is so important to all of us, including the accountancy profession. Accountants are perfectly placed in their position to have that real meaningful impact. The role of the accountancy profession is evolving. We're talking now of environmental sustainability and governance as opposed to just analysing numbers. We speak up, we hold businesses and the public sector and ourselves to a higher standard. The accounting profession has really provided the guidance to the innovators. Everyone is embracing the diversity and redefining the role of the finance function. The next generation will be attracted by a sense of purpose. It will become a more aspirational profession for young people as that ethical and trusted advisor. A better world, to me, is where businesses actually serve the needs of society. A better world where everyone will embrace accountability to protect the planet. Helping businesses to develop in a sustainable way. So that the decisions that we take as a result serve for the betterment of everybody. Good evening and welcome once again on behalf of the Institute of Directors. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all, our very esteemed and distinguished IOD members, IOD fellows, associates, and our distinguished guest and IOD India Global family. The Institute of Directors is hosting this very special evening in association with ACCA, Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, an international body of professional accountants representing a global community of 247,000 members and 526,000 future members based in 181 countries. The theme for this evening is Building Future Boards, Navigating Through Global Economic Challenges. In today's fast-paced and interconnected world, businesses are confronted with an ever-evolving landscape of economic challenges. To address these challenges, corporate boards play a pivotal role in steering organizations towards a future which is successful and sustainable. The theme encapsulates the essence of how boards are adapting to the complex economic forces shaping the business world. Tonight, we are honored and delighted that Ms. Helen Brand, OBE, the Chief Executive of ACCA, is among us, who will be delivering a keynote address. We also have amongst us Dr. Aruna Sharma, retired IS officer, independent member, Microfinance Institution Network, MFIN, former member, Digitization Committee, RBI, former Secretary, Ministry of Steel, Government of India, former Secretary, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India. We also have with us Mr. Shiv Shivakumar, Operating Partner, Advent International, former Group Executive President, Corporate Strategy and Business Development, Aditya Bala Group, former Chairman and CEO, India Region, PepsiCo. This will be followed by a panel discussion, and we have five distinguished speakers joining us for this, and they are Ms. Helen Brand, Mr. Siddharth Saeed, Mr. Anil Kumar, Ms. Kalpana Jain, and Dr. Amit Sureen. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, may I please request Mr. Ashok Kapoor, Director General, Institute of Directors, India, to kindly grace the dais. Please put your hands together and welcome on stage Mr. Ashok Kapoor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome on stage to our guest of honor, Dr. Aruna Sharma, 
IA, retired IS officer, independent member, Microfinance Institute Network, MFIN, former member, Digitization Committee, RBI, former secretary, Ministry of Steel, Government of India, former secretary, Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India. I would request Mr. Kapoor to please present uh, Dr. Aruna Sharma with a bouquet to welcome, welcome her here. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. I would now like to invite on stage Mr. Shiv Shivakumar, Operating Partner, Advent International, former Group Executive President, Corporate Strategy and Business Development, Aditya Billa Group. A round of applause for Mr. Shiv Shivakumar making his way up on st the stage. He's former Chairman and CEO, India Region, PepsiCo. Thank you so much, sir, for coming here. Now, please join me in extending a warm welcome to our distinguished keynote speaker, Ms. Helen Rand, OBE, Chief Executive, ACCA, who has traveled all the way from UK to be with us. A big round of applause for Ms. Helen Rand coming up on stage. I would request Ms. Ashok Kapoor to please present Pam with a bouquet. Thank you. May I now please request Mr. Ashok Kapoor, Director General, Institute of Directors, to deliver the welcome address. Mr. Ashok Kapoor was a former officer of the Indian Administrative Service, 1967 branch. He has served in the government in various capacities, including secretary and magistrates of various districts. During 1992-94, he was appointed the leader of the Indian delegation to the UN Conference on Biological Warfare. In September 1991, he was appointed as Joint Secretary, Ministry of Civil Supplies and Food and Science and Technology, Government of India. A round of applause for Mr. Ashok Kapoor. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and speakers. Uh, on behalf of IOD India, I have great pleasure in welcoming all of you to this special evening session celebrating our association with the ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants of UK. For more than 12 years now, IOD and ACCA have collaborated to improve good governance practices we are especially delighted to welcome Ms. Helen Brandt, OBE, Chief Executive of the ACCA in the United Kingdom, is in whose honor we have all assembled here today. The topical theme for today's discussion is building future boards navigating through global economic challenges. This is a critical and timely conversation that brings together a distinguished group of experts and thought leaders to share their insights, experiences, and strategies for steering organizations through the turbulent waters of the global economy. Expert described it, we all are living in a highly VUCA world, a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Volatil volatility represents the rapid and unpredictable fluctuations in the global economy. Today, the world is a global vill village. Fluctuation, recent fluctuations in the Silicon Valley Bank and the cred Credit Suisse Banks demonstrates this volatil volatility. Today, leaders overnight can become laggards, and laggards overnight can become leaders, as happened with SVB and Credit Suisse. Uncertainty. Uncertainty arises from political instability, shifting regulations, trade dispute, and unprecedented technological advancements. Complexity refers to the intricacies and interdependence within the global economy. Frightening pace of change, as Peter Drucker puts it very aptly. Earlier, policy dictated technology. Today, a time has come 
when technology is increasingly dictating policy? This is a question to ponder. Ambiguity manifests itself as regulatory changes, shifting market dynamics, and evolving consumer behavior, patterns that experts, that no expert can anticipate. For example, real estate, experts tell us, has become unreal estate. Why? Because around the globe, real estate is the main collateral of banks and lending institutions. Price fluctuations, rapid flight fluctuations in real estate have made it into an unreal estate. The, ch the journey through this complex landscape will require adaptability, strategic planning, continuing risk management, and collaborative efforts from all stakeholders. Friends, I would like to share with you all the latest IMF Global Financial Stability Report of 2023. It has warned that financial stability risks have increased rapidly as the resilience of the global financial system has faced a number of tests. Recent turmoil in the banking sector is a powerful reminder of the challenges posed by the interaction between tighter monetary and financial conditions and the buildup in vulnerabilities since the global financial crisis, ever since the global financial crisis of 2008. Large emerging markets have so far avoided adverse spillovers, but smaller and more fragile economies continue to confront worsening debt sustainability trends. For the first time in history, both borrowers and lenders are often at a loss. Borrowers often, very often, can't repay, and lenders lose their precious capital. It's happening all too often. It is a new phenomenon confronting all of us. We wonder what is the solution. Today, policy decisions made by corporate boards not only shape the future of individual companies, but also increasingly influence the broader global economic landscape. This makes it paramount that we explore innovative and effective ways to build resilient, forward thinking and agile boards that can nav navigate these complex economic challenges that lie ahead. This leads us to the emerging gospel or mantra that is ESG. Friends, ESG is good for business and integral to making the transition to renewables. But manipulation of supply chains, thanks to geopolitical calculations, is a potential spoiler. Most conversations about ESG, the environment, social, and governance framework, center around operational aspects rather than the spirit of what ESG stands for. Investor critics often gauge ESG investments through numerical comparisons, contrasting with the corporate's non-ESG investments. This comparison is a reality today staring us all squarely in our face. ESG is driven by the c compelling cost efficiencies of renewables, to cite an example. As the cost to use renewable energy sources reduces the silver lining in the dark clouds is dropping below that of fossil energy, fossil oil energy, a significant shift is underway. This reflects the undeniable economic advantages of renewables. Unlike fossil fuels, which are all the time prone to inflationary impacts, renewable energy costs remain relatively stable and are largely immune to global price fluctuations. This is where ESG comes into focus. ESG is not just useful. It is also commercially prudent Regulators and businesses alike will concede that ESG is the basis of sustainability of not only humanity, but as much as 
vi viability of industrial growth and its financial implications. To this end, I again specially welcome Ms. Helen Brand, OBE of ACCA, as the anchor said, all the way she has come from UK to give us her insights and her skills into the problems facing all of us. Our guests of honor today, Dr. Aruna Sharma, she is a very worthy colleague of mine. She was the former Secretary Steel. And Mr. Shiv Shankar. I also extend a warm welcome to our esteemed panelists, Mr. Saeed, Ms. Kalpana Jain, Dr. Anil Kumar, Mr. Harpreet Singh, and Dr. Amit Sareen, who have spared their valuable time to be here and participate in today's deliberations. We live in a world that is interconnected and ever-evolving. And today's discussions, we are sure, will help us chart a new course towards boards that are not only equipped to navigate the challenges of today, the great financial challenges, but are also prepared to thrive in the ever-evolving dynamics of the global economy of tomorrow. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor, for the warm welcome. You've really set the tone for the evening today. A quick introduction of our guest of honor, Dr. Aruna Sharma, an IS officer of the 1982 batch. She's an avid practitioner of development economics and has successfully employed her craft in her professional career. A catalyst of positive change, she has played a pivotal role in chalking out development-related blueprints and ensuring that its benefits percolate all, to all sections of the society. Steeped in traditions, she's a dance and music aficionado. We are truly delighted to have Dr. Sharma with us. I request Dr. Sharma to please address the audience, and I request all of you to please give her a huge round of applause. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me invite Ms. Helen to our country and this conference, Mr. Shiv Shankar, and of course, a wonderful introduction done by Dr. Kapoor. So that has set the ball rolling and made the job much easier for us. Definitely, the topic we are focusing today is building future boards and navigating through global economic challenges. One thing which has happened in pandemic is a change of path. What was happening was looking global. Suddenly, the insights of all the countries and companies was becoming to look inside and see the profits of the country. So if you look at the board, the policies changed. The various kind of duties for imports that were put by the countries without paying any respect, whether they are WTO compliant or not compliant, were imposed. Because everybody was looking at revival of the industries in their own country. So that's on the policy front. What happened in the composition of the boards, and that is very important, for a country like India, which is highly populated, where providing employment is a big challenge, the big companies where corporate governance is there, everybody want to drawing board to automate whichever, whatever place in the company is possible. In the sense, if I put it very bluntly, it is going to reduce the employment opportunities. That is going to happen. And this is for the corporate board to understand that when their job is to sort of protect the interest of the shareholder, and more and more technology and automation is going to come, the drawing board is very important, and the corporate governance for future has to understand that very clearly. What is important is to fulfill the social cause, the S part of the ESG, is the value chain, the supply chain, which comes through the small, medium enterprises. That hand-holding, the corporate has to understand by equipping, by hand-holding them, by bringing in, and that part will take care of the employment needs of the youth or the demographic dividend not being wasted. 
So a corporate board is with a very contrasting two kinds of responsibility in future. One, identify the places to be automated, use the best of the technology. Number two, handhold the supply chain both ways, uh, backward and front towards the market so that they become on par in quality protection as needed by the main corporate, as well as ensure that the employment responsibility is sort of divided among them. So it's not sought for the company itself which is expanding. Another challenge which is coming up is go green. You know, it's very fashionable, but nobody has a definition of what is green. You know, everybody in the world, we are fighting for it, trying to understand, is it just emission? Is it the entire input chain? Is it the, how we are going to calculate it? How we are going to stamp it? How we are going to go ahead with it? Again, pandemic pushed us back. What was thought and rightly said by Dr. Uh, Mr. Kapoor, that the fossil fuels were a complete no-no. And suddenly you ha had, in Europe, in US, all coal mines were opened up. 50 years, there is no looking back from coal. This understanding, the corporate boards have to understand in India, that as you are slowly going towards the non-renewable energy, or, or renewable energy, as your source, or if you are changing the input, you have to understand that coal is going to be your major fuel in whatever sector of industry you are working where coal is being used. And if that be there, the focus again changes as to how we capture the emissions. And that is very, very important that it is not, it's very easy to say no coal, but very impossible to implement. So. It is very important, the governance to be updated, to place the finger on the right problem what you're facing, so that your solution is something which is practicable, which is executionable, and which is going to also fulfill the benefit of going green. So this kind of a combination of thinking is very, very important as we are moving ahead. And today, if you look at the world, the way the, way the whole world is operating, and the corporate governance is working, it is very important in the board to have a combination of all kind of experts. You need a finance expert, you need from your chartered accountants, very, very vital these days uh, for any of the companies are in the board to have, you need the subject experts, and you need some visionary persons. That combination you must encourage in whichever board is being formed, you, whether and today, these days, even the promoter company is looking for the corporate governance. They are no longer the Lala company, what we used to call, that Lala says and it's executed. No, it's very professional there. And of course, the, where the corporate board, or it's a corporate governed company, of course it is there. So this kind of a combination is coming up and that kind of a thinking is coming up. So as a member of a board or a future board, this combination should also be encouraged so that the discussions are very, very meaningful and you are able to see what is happening. Plus also trigger the flaws in the policy making. This is very important when you are working upon it because there could be some policies which is going to actually hinder the entire sector. And who better can navigate it, flag it, propagate it than the board members who have little bit at stake being a member of the board of a particular company, but more as a sector specialist to flag it out and to bring it in the public domain and bring out that kind of a change in the policy work when you're working on it. And this is happening very rapidly when the use of the information technology is being used. Because the technology usage, the consumer adoption is way ahead than how it is reacting or how the policy making is happening. You just see a complete transformation in the consumer behavior that is happening. So your products, your manufacturing has to move accordingly. Another thing of the governance model I will say and which I observe personally, whichever company invested on their employees during the tough time of pandemic was the upper part of the K. They all recovered fastest. And the companies which went for not taking care of good governance of their own employees, pink slips, reduction of pay and everything, they were on the lower part of the key. 
So that clearly flags what is the responsibility of the board in these tough times. It is not just profit. Okay, your profit margin must have come down, but that is the time to be together. It's not an opportunity to clean up or to cut down the excess baggage that can follow later. You can identify, but not when the times are difficult. That helps the governance of the company. That helps and flags the commitment of the company. And definitely, that has been a major responsibility. You can look through many examples, and you will see that difference, that those companies were on the upper part of the K. They had a V recovery, absolute V recovery, when we went ahead with it. What is becoming very important today is the recession, or what the financial thing, what was pointed out by this. There are two kinds of reactions which is coming from the banks. When there is a need to give credit, it is becoming an expensive credit. Or with the kind of fear of default and banker being held responsible, what is shocking, and at least I'll say in India today, the reverse repo rate, you are having more and more deposits with the RBI than the liquidity being used for lending. Now, this is shocking. What is the real job of the bank? It is to lend, to handhold, to trigger the economy, to ensure that more and more money is floated, to multiply, whether in manufacturing, investment, research, wherever it has to be. But that is not happening. It's like an on hold. And this is where the corporates have to work ahead to ensure that the expansion of the company is going ahead. And another change in behavior that has happened in the CapEx investment is, the good big companies are thinking to save and invest and expand than taking credit. So this kind of a mentality is coming that put your own resource at least 50% and let 50% be taken on credit. Then you are viable. Otherwise, with the high credit rates, with no surety of where, uh, what level of credit rates and your ratings are going to affect, how the banks are going to react on that, whether you will end up into a bankrupt company or declared a bankrupt company, all these are having an effect, and that's where the gov corporate governance has to have a vigil on the finances. Many a times, the audit committee, if you look at it, of the corporates is at least, you know, maybe whosoever is the chair is chairing it, or just the numbers are being seen, no. That is the place to have an in-depth look for the corporate to have for these tendencies that whether you are building up for the future investments of your expansion plan, are you, is your rating improving day by day? Are you getting a cheaper credit because of your better rating? Where are you moving it? How are your finances? Are you wasting? Or are you productively using it? All these things are equally important, how you're moving ahead into the entire cycle. And that's where, if you look at it, of the corporate board governance, these committees are very important. And now, these days, you also have a risk management committee. For that only. Because who knows better than you the possible risk that company is going to have. So these committees are not a formality. That's the single point I would like to make here. These committees are with a purpose for the board because you bring in, as the members of the board, the vast knowledge, the vast experience, diversified knowledge. And that is what makes the difference when you're going ahead. Today, you have these challenges in front of you, and you, you look at it also. The way uh, going green is concerned, maybe your organization, IOD, can help to define it. Because how do you give credits to the supply chain? How it is going to happen? Because if you look at the uh, renewable energy, it is going in the same grid from where you are tapping down. So what percentage of credit you get because what energy you are using has come from multiple sorts of making that energy. It's not a one is to one kind of a ratio that is happening. And that credit giving is a very difficult task. Today we are not able to answer that task. That how are the carbon credits going to be put there? And whether the another fear, it's whether this going green is going to be a non-tariff barrier, because we don't want to import from you, uh, 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 import from you. So to, it is very important for the board to see 
that if they are into the import zone, whatever percentage they are in, whether across the globe, wherever their potential market is there, they have to be alert that it does not become a uh, sort of uh, a, a, a mechanism just to stop their exports and the import by that country for any other reasons. And that is what is very important to, again, watch for the boards. So if you look at the board or the composition of the board, it's very important. You must understand the sector. You must understand what is happening across the globe for that sector, what your peer group are doing. The good boards have at least half an hour devoted comparing themselves with their peer groups in all the parameters. Whatever numbers are there in public domain, they are compared. So this is one of the good practices for future. It is very important. The kind of future expansion you are thinking of will be more automation, more use of technology, less use of employment, and yes, of course, the kind of CapEx money you are going to generate from, from where you are going to get. Then it is very equally important is this diversified kind of a knowledge which comes on the board. So diversified membership of the board does not only mean gender, new, uh, gender or different kind of combination. It's the kind of expertise which is coming on the table. So that kind of a diversification is also needed for the future of the board. Today, when you're looking at the boards, what is coming is definitely exceptional leadership. Because the world is competitive, wherever you get the cheaper goods, the world moves there. And this is what the China has showed that way. And what is equally important is the geopolitical problem of the supply chains, which was mentioned, and all that can be very disturbing. It can disrupt you completely. And pandemic has taught each one of us something which came out of blue. Nobody had a control on it. Nobody knew what is happening. Every, the entire world came to a standstill, which nobody could ever dream that world can come to a standstill, and it happened. So that kind of a risk mitigation is also important, how we are going to sail through this kind of disasters if it is going to hit. Unfortunately, these days, it's also the troubled geopolitical areas, literally a war, how it has disrupted. If you look at Ukraine, I think it is in IT, in steel making, it is one of the best combinations. Everything is disrupted there. Everything is disrupted. So you can imagine the kind of board that needs there. So these are the places, these are the places, these are the combinations, these are the market relations where disruption comes and you have to re-enter the market. So the board also has to be very conscious of the mechanism and prepare themselves to mitigate that difficult times and capable to re-enter the market and go ahead. So I will end by giving just one example how in textiles, India worked very well during the pandemic. It used that time to enter the world of Europe and United States by e-commerce. That is what happened. They used the technology, they entered that market, made mistakes. You know, in India, we like floral prints on our linen. Whereas in UK, you like bland, plain colors. So the first entire lot of these textile industry went kaput. So they got a market feedback, advantage of technology, immediate real-time feedback, they changed their supply chain. And today, literally, they have a great business in Western world, whether it is US or UK. They have found their place. So why I'm giving you this example, when the world was on the downstream, where everything was coming to a standstill, one sector which used that as an opportunity to enter into a vacuum and establish themselves. So this is where, again, the role of the board comes to identify such opportunities instead of taking an excuse of, oh, everything is beyond control, everything has gone. That's where the real leadership comes. I really thank that you all are deliberating on these issues because these issues are very, very important for the growth of any sector you are working with or contributing to because the sector has to understand the peer group, the competition, the flaws with them and corrections and not forget about the ESG 
and governance is looking after your own employees, equally important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your address. Uh, very, very important tips for board members on how to navigate the VUCA world. I would now like to introduce our next guest of honor, Mr. Shiv Shivakumar. He's an engineer from IIT Madras and followed it up with management courses at IM Kolkata and the Wharton Business School. He has received many awards for leadership, turnaround transformations, brand building, HR practices, etc. He was awarded the KPMG IMA Award for Outstanding Leadership and the Asian Association of Management Organization Asia Leadership Award. Mr. Shivakumar is also a prominent speaker, delivering over 25 convocation speeches at various top business schools like I am Kozikod, I am Trichy, I am Nagpur, and others. He's a regular contributor to business press, teaches at premier business schools, and is a sought after speaker for corporate events. He has authored three books, Reflections, a compilation of Shiv's articles, The Right Choice, Resolving 10 Career Dilemmas, and The Art of Management. Please put your hands together for Mr. Shivakumar. So the Institute of Directors, uh, Mr. Kapoor, uh, Mrs. Aruna Sharma, Helen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, absolute delight to be here this evening to talk about a topic which I think will never go out of fashion. The whole concept of governance, the whole concept of directorship, the whole concept of what you need to do as a good director. What I will do over the next 15 minutes is to give you 10 lessons from what I've learned being on boards. I've been on about a dozen boards, uh, commercial, educational, as well as uh, non-profit organizations. To start with, I want to mention to you that India has the highest number of listed companies in the world, 5,200. Okay, America has 3,400 or odd. India has the highest number of listed companies. They're not going to go south. It might actually increase. However, we have a dearth of directors. We have just about 2,000 directors who are there in all 5,200 companies. So India needs very good directors. If there's one message which I want all of you to take out is that we need more and more directors. We can't just be satisfied with the current set of directors that we have. Okay. Next, the market cap of all the 5,200 companies put together is about 1.1 times our GDP. So if you truly want to create value for companies, that number should be significantly higher than where it is today. So there's a long way to go. So lesson number one, all boards need a global outlook. There is not a single board which can say, we are insulated, India is insulated, we don't need to worry. I'll just give you simple stats. The top 10 countries in the world, okay, the top 10 countries in the world by export or import have 50% of the imports or exports in the world, the top 10. The top 16 countries in the world with a population of more than 100 million account for 84% of consumption in the world. Whichever way you look at it, India will not be isolated from the rest of the world. India is a fundamental part of the value chain, a fundamental part of the consumption story which is happening. So we have to be integrated. So all boards need a global outlook. We have global issues like climate, like privacy, like DEI, like citizenship, and technology. All of them impact both Indian and global organizations. And you must have a view. Okay, so every board member cannot excuse himself or herself by saying that we are immune. There's no board which is immune to the global winds. That's my first point to you. Second point to you, how do boards run, my experience? A lot of emphasis I lay on the chair of the board, the chairman of the board. The chairman of the board, his discipline, her discipline, her focus, his focus, determines how a board is run. And it's a very important role. And we as board members, and wherever I have been a board member, I try to influence that angle to ensure that the chairman has more voice and more power so that he or she can bring in change. That's very important. Okay. So you have the chair of the board, you have the members. Always select members 
to be the very best representatives you can get on the board. Do not go. India has a mistaken notions of going for friends and family. Don't do that. It's very simple. You are in the market for highly talented board members. You don't want high quality talent on your boards, you will get low quality results in your company. As simple as that. So it's extremely important that you set the bar high. Because remember, in the company, the CEO, the management team, your media, your shareholders, your stakeholders, are all looking at the board and saying, is this a bunch of friends and family, or this bunch truly professional who will do the very best? So to me, get the very best people on the board. Okay. Next is, you represent stakeholders and society. What's important for board is not to have oversight. It's an overused word. Everybody talks of oversight. I truly submit to you, you need insight and not oversight. Anybody can do oversight, but very few people can do an insight, you know, sitting in a board. My third lesson for, for you is all board members must have the intellectual rigor and honesty when they come to a board meeting. I've seen many board members come unprepared for board meetings. They just come and do what I call surround sound management. You know, oof, 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 say a few things. I attended this board, I attended that board. Useless stuff. Who is bothered whether you attended this board or that board? We are discussing this board. We are focused on this board. Can you add value to this board? Extremely important. So a board member who is not in intellectually honest and rigorous is not going to contribute to that company or to the board. Okay? There's an old joke which goes, why aren't horses invited to board meetings? Because boards don't want naysayers. Okay? They only want yes-sayers. Okay? So one of the things I always judge a board on is, who is challenging whom and why? Are we challenging the real issue and really bringing to the surface the key points which are necessary? Okay? The key thing for a good board, intellectually honest and rigorous board, is to ask the right questions, not to provide the answers. The role of a board is to ask really tough and difficult questions. The more you are able to practice that, the better that board will be, the better other people will learn from you. Next. Lesson number four, involvement with the operating team. Some boards get too cozy and too involved with the operating team. That's a mistake. The operating team is the operating team. You have to give them the support. You have to hold them accountable for results. We cannot do their job. You know, much as we might know the industry, much as we might know the issue, they have to realize what they need to do, not us. We have to ask the right questions and prep them. Number five. The non-negotiables, you must always uphold shareholder and stakeholder values. Who are you representing there is a very important question. And many times board members and boards forget that, whom they're representing. They are not representing the person who's appointed you. You are representing a broader set than the person who's appointed you. And that distinction is very important to be a, a truly good board member. Next, number six, clarity on roles. In my experience, a role can only do the following. Set strategy, hold the CEO for delivery, look at senior management hires, manage the risk compliance matrix, okay? have very clear governance rules, okay? have respect in the board, and have accountability for financial targets. That's all a board can do. Focus on that and do the best in that. Everything else, we can throw it out of the window. You know, it doesn't apply. Next, a very important aspect, audit committees. I've been on many audit committees and many boards. You know, in audit committees, there are two things I want to, you know, mention. One is an old quote by Ronald Reagan, the great president of America. He said, trust but verify. It's a very important thing if you're part of an audit committee. You must trust, but you must verify. Don't lose your ability not to verify. The next one, I used to be on the Godrej Consumer Products Board for years, for eight years. Bharat Doshi, who was also on the RBI board, he used to be the audit chair. Every meeting, Daraya's the auditor would come in. At the end of the meeting, Bharat Doshi used to ask one question which I used to like, and I always carried to other boards. And he would say, Daraya's, is there anything that this board should know that you think we don't know? Is there anything the management is telling you not to tell us? That's all he used to ask. 
That's all we can do as board sitting on an audit committee. We can't pour over numbers and second decimal points and see what's happening. Okay? We can make your, you know, ourselves comfortable by asking that one question. Number eight, I think board members of tomorrow don't need to worry about the past. The future is not going to be an extrapolation of the past. I think every company is recognizing it. If I were to give you a simple stat, every 10 years, 170 companies on the Fortune 500 or the S&P 500 disappear. Because they all assume that the past will continue in the future. It's no different in India. We've lost something like 30 airlines in the last 25 years, 3-0. There are many retail companies which are dead. There are many commodity companies which are dead. So one of the roles of a board member is not to worry about the past, but to look at the future, be prescient and say, what is going to change in the future for us to be competitive? Who is going to be our comp competition in the future? And that will come from left field. It will not be your current set of competitors. So look ahead, whether whatever is happening around in the world, okay, be prescient about it, but please ensure that you focus the company on the future. Number nine, very important in social media world today. Reputation is the 24 by 7 by 200 country matrix. Something which happens somewhere in the world and connected to your company can impact you. So it's 24 by 7, it's across all 200 company, 200 countries which are out there in the world. Anything can hit you in social media. So you have to be extra prepared and you have to be extra cautious about what you say or what you don't say as a board member as well as as a company. So please do you know, take note of that. Finally, my last point, the license to operate. Uh, in today's world, you get from society a daily visa or a daily pass to operate. It, trust is won or lost every 24 hours. You get up at 6 in the morning, you've either lost trust or you won trust in society. And that accumulates, and then that determines what happens to your company or what happens to the board. So the license to operate is a 24 by 7 journey. Please be very careful about it. It does not come in quarters. It's not a QSQT as most board members think, which is quarter say, quarter tuck. That's not what it is. It's a daily game of trust in a future world. And finally, uh, you know, every chair of the board, every owner in a company says that he wants like-minded board members. With the joke we always say is that he wants people to like his mind. And that's why he wants those board members and not board members who challenge him. But I'm sure that all of you will do the right thing in your boards and drive the very best results for your organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We've got loads and loads of tips and uh, your insightful words, I'm sure, will go back with many people in the audience today. Thank you so much. I would now like to introduce uh, Ms. Helen Brandt, OBE, Chief Executive ACCA. Ms. Brandt built her career within professional bodies and has considerable experience and knowledge of the 180 markets in which ACCA currently operates. She is the founding member of the International Integrated Reporting Council and as vice chair of the IIRC board, she is a regular media commentator on the role of ethics and the delivery of public value play in business and society. In 2011, ACCA became the first international professional body to publish an integrated report on its performance. She has driven ACCA's pioneering work in supporting the development of professions across Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. She received an OBE Queen's Birthday Honors list in June 2011 for services to accountancy and an honorary doctorate for the from the University of Exeter. Personified Einstein, everything that counts in life cannot be counted. Ms. Brand is truly a distinguished brand ambassador of ACCA and the UK. I'm also pleased to inform you that Ms. Brand is also a distinguished fellow of IOD. We are very delighted to have Ms. Helen Brand, who has come all the way from the UK to be with us today and share her valuable insights. We are grateful to her for her deep commitment and unstinted support towards the IOD. Please put your hands together and welcome on the podium, Ms. Brand.
<laughs> well, good evening, everyone. I have three very hard acts to follow, but nonetheless, um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And thank you so much to our hosts, I IOD India, for staging this splendid event. I'm so pleased to have this chance to say that ACCA places enormous value on our partnership with the Institute of Directors. And this, uh, this occasion is a great opportunity to renew those links and to pledge our continued support in sharing our insights on the challenges, issues, and themes that face all of us in the world. Tonight's theme, Building Future Boards, Navigating Through Global Economic Challenges, is especially well chosen and it's perfectly suited to this audience. It's all about, uh, it's all about how we build effective boards that work and how we as directors and business leaders stay ahead of global trends and especially how we build trust and transparency with the public, regulators, investors, government, and with anyone who has an interest in supporting businesses and economies which are sustainable through to the middle of this century and beyond. Th this question of sustainability in particular has rocketed to the top of the business agenda everywhere and rightly so. It's about climate change of course, which I'll talk about a little, but not just climate change, it's a much broader concept. And I do my best to describe some of the wider issues of sustainability which present themselves to business leaders, whether they're in India or anywhere else in the world. It's important because the issue of sustainability goes to the heart of why people should trust us with stewardship of business activity and the health of national economies. There's a phrase that people in business once used to, re to repeat when they talked about the challenge they faced in adapting to any kind of change, and you've all heard it, I'm sure. The phrase is operating on a burning platform. And it sprang to mind when the United Nations published its emissions gap report. That report said that as matters stand, there is no credible pathway to keeping the leap in global temperatures below the critical threshold of 1.5 degrees centigrade. Scientists agree that going beyond 1.5% centigrade will see dangerous impacts for people all over the world. So it painted a frightening picture of the dangers posed by accelerating climate change and of a world battered by ever-increasing extreme weather events and entire, entire countries consumed by wildfire and floods. It pointed to a terrible future of a world that is both a burning platform and a drowning platform. And I don't have to spell that out to the audience in India, not as we watch while the country suffers ever-increasing bouts of drought and with people in peril of displacement because flooding threatens to make their homeland in uninhabitable. It's in this context that we talk about the broad concept of sustainability in business, and as we try to agree on what boards can do to turn back the tide of climate destruction. A generation ago, this was still a fringe issue. A, a concern for the environment was dismissed as an obsession for eccentrics, and it was a long, long way from the top of corporate priorities. Now we know better, we're better informed. There's no excuse and there's no hiding place. Science has removed any doubt about the reality of what human-made climate change means for our future. Those who deny it are the eccentrics now and the consensus that we need real change is universal. So what can we do? I know that when we watch upsetting images of destruction from the latest climate-related tragedy, there's a temptation to throw up our hands and imagine the problem is too deeply rooted for us to fix. After all, how can individuals or business, a single business make a difference? I'm especially happy to speak to this audience on this issue today because as board directors and as business and community leaders, you are perfectly placed to serve as powerful advocates for sustainability. Everyone here is in a position to help protect businesses by making them aware of the importance of sustainability and how it affects their standing in the marketplace. In our own way, at our own level, in our daily working lives, we can act as champions for sustainable business. It's important that we present sustainability as good business sense. Yes, of course, there is a moral argument for sustainable business behavior, but no one likes to be preached at. Companies are on different stages of the journey. 
M many companies won't take steps until it is financially compelling. So leaders have a duty to demonstrate that sustainable business is also smart business. There's a clear ethical case for placing sustainability at the heart of your business, but there is more to it than that moral dimension. Every director also owns a responsibility to their business to defend and promote their commercial interests, but there's no conflict between those things. This is about risk and the danger of reputational damage and about the danger by, that by not doing enough, customers won't want to trade with the business, investors won't want to invest in it, and people won't want to work there. Now this is happening now as more big institutional investors widen their criteria for allocating capital to include many more measures than simple profit and loss. There's a re revolution in how value is measured in businesses with an ever-growing emphasis on ESG measures, environment, social and governance. Put simply, the way we keep score in business is changing, and ACCA believes that the clamour for more change, for greater em emphasis on the sustainable op operations, will only accelerate. The pressure for more action on ESG is coming from above and below, from governments and investors, and from consumers, who are ever more discerning in how they choose to spend their money and who they choose to spend it with. I believe that as the climate crisis and economic turmoil worsen and concerns about sustainability widen, these attitudes will become more prevalent and more powerful. And we know business gets it. ACCA's report, Climate Action and the Accountancy Profession, Building a Sustainable Future, set out clearly how businesses could increase efforts to be more sustainable and to make more of a positive impact on society. It built on an earlier report from ACCA called Mainstreaming Impact, Scaling a Sustainable Recovery, which showed that 90% of the business leaders we surveyed all around the world agreed that it was important to promote sustainability. Clearly, the debate on whether sustainability is the future of a business has been concluded. It's now time for action. It's our only future. For ACCA, the success of our efforts to build sustainable businesses rests on how we measure good performance. It's about how the market responds to what businesses do, about which businesses are rewarded or penalized for their efforts on sustainability. It's, how, it's about changing how we view what value really means. To do that effect effectively and efficiently, it's important we agree a, gro a global framework of standards that is easy for every business to understand. And that's why ACCA is proud to support the work of the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which was launched at COP26 in Glasgow. It's forging a global consensus on the direction reporting needs to follow, building on existing standards and bringing them together in a coherent, integrated whole. It's about making regulation and reporting more consistent and universal, replacing the broken jigsaw of ill-fitting pieces with one clear picture of effective measurement that makes sense to every business, big or small, everywhere in the world. It's also about promoting the concept of integrate, the integrated report, close to ACCA's heart and my heart, which is a crucial tool in letting the sun shine in on a business's activities. It's about recording performance results in a clear way across measures which extend further than profit and loss to include impacts on the environment and societies, so that investors and everyone and anyone who wants or needs to know how an organization is operating can find simply all the information they desire. It's the only way that a sustainable market can function efficiently, efficiently by giving investors and consumers all the information they need to make good decisions. It's the only way that we can ensure that responsible, sustainable businesses are rewarded in the marketplace and the best way of sending corrective messages to poor performers. This is important because unless we can agree on a clear view of how we account for our actions in business, we're lost in a smoke of confusion. This raises important issues which go to the heart of our theme tonight to do with compliance, especially transnational compliance with international standards and with governance. And I'd like to spend a few moments setting out ACCA's view on what we mean by good corporate governance. First of all, it's essential for both financial and economic stability and sustainable growth. 
It supports companies and organizations in their long-term performance and in building resilience in the face of upheaval and change. We believe that while the legislative frameworks can help achieve a minimum standard in governance practice, governments should also show strong support for voluntary measures which improve transparency and the adoption of internationally accepted corporate governance principles. The enforcement of superficial targets is no substitute for a principles-based approach to corporate culture based on a well-defined purpose, set of values and vision that is verified regularly. We believe that the most successful companies are those that genuinely engage with their stakeholders, including their employees, through a clear sense of purpose, strategy and direction, strong, consistent communication across the organization, transparent fairness up and down the organization. The effective management of risk is essential in ensuring an organization meets its strategic objectives as well as meeting regulatory and compliance requirements. Given today's intense and fast-changing risk landscape, boards are under significant pressure to be more accountable for their stewardship, and that includes preparing for potential threats and considering the risks and opportunities in all decision-making. The ownership of effective risk management in the company always rests with the board and cannot sit with any one siloed designated function. This is because the board is tasked to determine the overall approach to risk, including the organization's risk appetite, and to oversee the effectiveness of risk management of the organization delegated by senior management. For risk management to function effectively, a risk-aware culture must run up and down the comp uh, company. The board, of course, must set the tone and lead by example to ensure that the entire organization and its people understand the part they play. Risk management is very importantly inseparable from strategy and performance. It involves everyone in the organization and allows risk to be assessed in all conversations and decision making. Professional accountants can play their part in gathering the key information needed to understand the organization's risk and make sure they're presented consistently to decision makers. Their professional training and code of ethics means their understanding of risk in business goes far beyond financial reporting, uh, but in creating and assessing the appropriate governance frameworks and indeed providing the foresight needed to navigate the volatile and uncertain world we live in. Compliance with international targets is increasingly a hot topic everywhere for companies, countries and communities all over the planet. Demonstrating and acting on a commitment to the public good, on environmental concerns, on social and economic fairness for all people, have not become just nice to have an eye-catching claim in a glossy corporate brochure, but a moral license for businesses to operate, trade, and even exist. It is in response to this quickly changing attitude towards the purpose of business that ACCA is publishing a report entitled Just Transition to coincide with the next COP conference in Dubai in November and December. It will share our strong belief that words are no longer enough. Only measurable actions, complete accountability, and a willingness to report results and impacts honestly, openly, and transparently meets the needs of our time. I know that tonight's occasion will play a crucial role in advancing this work and ensuring that together we build sustainable businesses and economies that work for all people, whoever they are, wherever they are. Finally, I think this event is so timely, useful, and constructive because it brings us together to remind us that our efforts are not isolated. They work, feed into a worldwide drive to build a business culture that respects sustainability and promotes long-term economic health. We really are all in this together as business leaders and as citizens of the world. I, knew that, I know that the work mood has swung between the urgent need for change in the way we run our economies and businesses and that we're pushing at an open door on this issue. The only question that remains for all of us is to decide which precise actions our own businesses can take to make our difference. It's about how we make a positive contribution to promoting the long-term sustainability of business and to protect the planet for our grandchildren to enjoy. We no longer have the luxury to debate the merits or otherwise of sustainable business 
We know enough to, that the clock has ticked down and the alarm is sounding. So our time to take action is now, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Big round of applause for our distinguished speakers on stage. We have taken away lots of useful nuggets that board members can apply in everyday life. We thank you all for taking the time and coming here. Let's get started with our panel discussion and invite on stage the moderator for this session. Please put your hands together and welcome on stage Mr. Mohammed Sajid Khan, Director, India ACCA. Mr. Khan is Director, India at ACCA. His control builds on over 17 years of experience working for ACCA, where he has gained considerable experience in projects that develop and sustain the accountancy profession, working with partners and other stakeholders to meet the demand for professional accountants across growing economies. So please put your hands together and welcome on stage <laughs> Mr. Sajid Khan. Now, joining him on stage are our distinguished speakers. Please put your hands together and welcome on stage Mr. Sadaf Saeed, Chief Executive Officer, Mudood Microfin Limited. Mr. Saeed is the founding CEO of Mudood Microfin Limited. Since the start of the business in 2010, Mr. Saeed led Mudood Microfin Limited to become the fourth largest NBFC MFI in the country, managing 7,000 crore rupee AUM, catering to 2.1 million rural households. Mr. Saeed has two decades of experience in banking and financial services industry. He has worked in leadership roles with various financial services organizations such as Pandana Spurti Financial Limited, India Bulls Financial Services, Saturn Credit Care, HDFC Bank and GE Money. He has hands-on experience in policy making, credit administration, operations and risk management. Please put your hands together and welcome on stage Ms. Kalpana Jain, partner Deloitte India. Ms. Kalpana Jain has been with Deloitte for more than 25 years. She provides advice and counsel on M&A, joint ventures, valuations, and fundraising for market transactions. She has been a partner since April 2006 and has been significantly involved in the retail and consumer sectors as well. In 2013, she was recognized as one of the 25 most talented women professionals of India by CMO Asia and World Brand Congress. She was named Superwoman of Delhi in 2016 by Radio One. She has been the chairperson of Private Equity and Venture Capital Association of India and is also a member of Deloitte India Coordinating Board. She speaks regularly with top tier media as well as prominent industry conferences and also frequently coaches and mentors young entrepreneurs in various forums and workshops as a charter member of the Indus Entrepreneurs Style. Please welcome on stage Dr. Anil Kumar, Independent Director, LIC, and the CEO, University of Delhi Foundation, <laughs> Professor, Department of Commerce, Delhi School of Economics, University of Delhi. Dr. Kumar is an accomplished professional holding key positions as Independent Director at Life Insurance Corporation of India, CEO of University of Delhi Foundation, and the Professor at Department of Commerce, Delhi School of Economics. He is an alumnus of SRCC, Delhi School of Economics, and Harvard Business School, specializing in finance, corporate governance, and higher education. Please welcome on stage with a round of applause, Mr. Harpreet Singh, partner PWC. Mr. Singh is a partner in risk consulting practice of PWC with a focus on governance, risk, and compliance space. As a partner, he handles a diverse portfolio of clients, helping them set up governance frameworks, risk management, compliance, and internal audits. He has advised boards of large listed corporates on designing structured frameworks to conduct board evaluations. His experience of interacting with senior board members arms him with sharp insights on prevailing trends and practices on board governance. Please welcome on stage Dr. Amit Sureen, Dean Academics, IMT Ghazibad. Dr. Sureen has accumulated over 26 years of experience in both academics and the industry. A round of applause for Dr. Amit Sureen as he makes his way up onto the stage. He has worked with prominent information technology and telecom firms such as TCS and Aircel in India and the United States. 
His expertise lies in various areas, including business relation management, program management, operations, information technology, human resource management, talent acquisition, account management, and general management. Please welcome on stage once again, Helen Brandt of ACCA. We are back. Uh, we look forward to listening to her views once again. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome all members of this panel discussion. So a round of applause for everybody on stage. And I'm going to hand it over to the moderator to steer this discussion forward. Thank you very much. A very good evening to you all. I'm glad to be back in Delhi and also to be back with the IOD family. And it's my pleasure to moderate today's discussion on this very topical theme of building future boards and how do we navigate through the global economic challenges. Today we have, as you can see, eminent panelists coming from different business sectors, diverse backgrounds, and they bring with them rich experience, wisdom, and insights that we can all share today. And today we are going to be hearing to them. I don't want to spend more time on building the context, but I just want to spend a few seconds just to give the format of today's discussion. Given the economic challenge that we are facing, we have just identified five critical areas that we all need to focus on, the board should focus on, to be able to navigate through these economic challenges. And instead of every speaker speaking on all the areas, we have identified each speaker with that one area. And once they have spoken on those respective areas, we will ask them one question on your behalf. And if you get time, of course, we'll open up again for questions that you may have at the end. With that, I would like to invite, first of all, my colleague Helen to talk about what is the importance of innovation and adaptation in navigating through these economic challenges. So um, innovation and adaptation, I guess we all know that and we, we've heard already about the importance of looking forward. So that innovation piece is, has, to, has to be absolutely con constant. But having identified how you need to innovate, you have to make it happen, and that's the adaptation piece. So having identified the inv innovation that's needed, have you got the uh, capability within the organization to actually put that into practice? And we know there are a lot of plans, programs, ideas that sync without trace within organizations unless you have a systemic approach to the adaptation of the, um, of the innovation ideas. So from a board perspective, um, we think you need to be promoting that culture of innovation uh, from the top all the time. Um, and it's not as a one-off exercise. It's in the conversations you're having at every board. Um, and it's that anticipating and responding to change. So again, um, responding is fine, but anticipating is even better. Um, and having that forward-looking piece that enables you uh, to innovate Embracing technology, um, and with the technology, of course, comes the data and the analytics that, that go along with that. But I think the board really has to be insisting now on that technological dimension uh, to any organization's uh, operations and, and culture. And then that focus that we talked about that's broader than climate of um, so society and social responsibility. Uh, what is the contribution that your organization is making to society, and what is the impact uh, that your organization is having on society, which of course includes your employees. So I see um, uh, uh, innovation and adaptation being enabled by all of those elements, and the board making sure that on their agenda, um, all of those headings are being addressed uh, in, in every conversation. Thank you, Helen, for highlighting the importance of innovation, and of course, the proactive approach that we need to take thinking ahead. With that, let's move on to Mr. Saeed. Uh, it'd be good to hear from you. What's the importance of risk management resilience building? You have heard in the opening session, some of the speakers have talked about risk management also. You know, how do we build the resilience? What's the importance? Can you just share your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Sajid. Uh, thank you, first of all, IOD, for putting this together and inviting us. Uh, uh, Thank you for all the panelists here, and uh, good, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think the topic at hand uh, that has been given to me is uh, risk management in building resilience uh, in context of our boards. 
I think uh, this is a topic which is close to my heart. I've studied risk management. I've practiced risk management for last two decades. So something that I relate to very closely. But before that, uh, I need to kind of define my perception of governance and how you achieve good risk management uh, through the board and through the governance. So usually uh, we confuse uh, governance as following the law. Uh, I feel that it's not just the law. It is a layer above that, which is uh, the expectation of the stakeholders. That's governance part. But good governance is above that. So if you are managing the expectation of the stakeholder, that doesn't mean only the shareholders. That means the regulator, uh, the bankers, the employees, the ecosystem, the government, everybody. If you're taking care of their expectation, that's what I call as good governance. So having said that, uh, I think in the context of industry that I represent, uh, which is the banking and financial services industry, a lot has been happening lately. I think uh, uh, financial services regulators are very, very proactive. Uh, in fact, so much so that we have been complaining that every, every month there is a circular. But I think it all in good stead. I think we are evolving very rapidly. Uh, we have seen certain things come in, like something like an ECL approach to risk management in terms of provisioning, which is kind of a basic. But then more on the governance side that putting a CRO is becoming a mandatory for organization which have crossed 50 billion of asset under management. Then putting a chief compliance, of, uh, compliance officer in place. So all of this is in good state for the organization. But I think uh, risk management is far, far wider. Uh, these are enabling provision, supervisory provisions, so, to, so as to ensure that the organization goes in the right direction. But what these functions and roles do is more important. I think uh, during the address, opening address, Dr. Kapoor quoted an example of Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, I think that is very interesting uh, kind of an example. If you look at Silicon Valley Bank, what they did wrong, they didn't take a very high risk bet. They actually took the lowest risk bet. They put all the money in a treasuries of government, so treasury bills, and they were all 10-year treasuries and every all the money. The wrong thing that they did was uh, being, being uh, in the location where they were located, they were only concentrating on businesses, which were related to Silicon Valley and their uh, businesses were startups and everything. So all of their assets were coming from there, all of their liabilities were coming from there. So there was a concentration risk. So had there been a, a government policy, a governance policy within the board that uh, you need to diversify your business, I think they would not have seen such a issue. Second thing also, when you do uh, things which are fairly simple, but if you don't look at uh, scenarios which could be out of whack, like what happened to treasury yields and everything, and all the money was in treasury, uh, long-term treasury, and it went down and they had MTM losses, so face, they faced an issue. So that is one example. But I think the world is filled with examples. Usually what happens is hubris is what kills us. Uh, you can take, I don't want to take any name, but uh, you have examples like uh, Kodak, Kodak as in, or Fujifilm, which was like a uh, uh, kind of market share, which was almost like 80% market share at the peak of their cycle. But then the revolution came in, technology came in, mobile have the photographs. You don't need any more those uh, film roles to develop. Similarly, it happens with Nokia. So there are, world is filled with examples. So one thing that we have learned out of uh, the COVID pandemic and everything that has happened that you need to be very agile. Mm -hmm. The risk management has to be forward looking. It cannot be just managing your today's risk. It has to be forward looking. And I think uh, the regulator has done a good job in terms of putting ECL method of risk management and provisioning in the financial service sector, especially the lending businesses I'm talking about. So risk ECL is what? ECL is uh, predicting the possibility of default and what is the loss giving default. And you predict that and you arrive at a provision. The traditional method of uh, uh, IGAP was you arrive at a provision, what is your risk appetite, 
then you create a provision for that. What is the probability of default there as well? But this is much more forward looking. It takes all encompassing risk, the risk of macros, the risk of any sort of a natural calamity, uh, risk of economic downturn, everything is there. So I think that's the right approach. And that's where I think the governance should be emphasized with. And you should look at all encompassing risk. And for that, I think uh, there is a good amount of framework that has put in place uh, when there are audit committees which are necessary, which requires role of directors. And role of director is very important. The audit committee uh, which has been put in place has to have majority of the independent directors and the chairman should be independent directors. And it should be, as somebody said during that, it should be a functional audit committee. So right, uh, Mr. Shivkumar said, the right questions should be asked. So nowadays I can tell you by experience because I'm practicing today. The regulator is looking at the minutes. The regulator is saying whether there was a counter opinion given or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Whether you just said you assembled and you just approved everything and you moved on with life. It's not the same. So regulator is saying where is the minutes, where is the uh, counter questions, what is the, was there a dissent given by anybody on any of the decisions. So that's very important. So I totally agree with Mr. Shokumar's opinion, uh, Mr. Shiva's opinion that uh, there has to be dissent, there has to be a discussion, then uh, things move on. There is, of course, uh, a nomination remuneration committee that is there, which has a good role of an independent director. It has to be because ultimately any business has a very, very significant people's risk. Uh, essentially, in financial services, when you are selling a service, you are not selling a product, uh, which is your something that you are manufacturing. So your people are very important because it's all about knowledge, how you have dealt with the customer, how you have cracked the market, or how you have developed the product in a form of service. So that's very important. How, how, what is your strategy in terms of retention? What is your strategy in terms of hiring and everything? That is very, very important. Then you have, of course, the risk management committee, and risk management committee looks at everything uh, from your enterprise level risk, from information security risk, from cyber security risk to the portfolio level risk policy. So I think uh, that has become very, very important. I think. Uh, two things, uh, I've talked about uh, risk, but uh, from a resilience point of view, if you look at, uh, I think risk and governance go hand in hand. Uh, they are not kind of two different things, basically. Uh, you have good risk management policies, then you will have good governance, and if you have good governance, of course, you will have uh, good risk management policies. But to build resilience, uh, you need to have uh, far sight, you have to be uh, forward looking risk management policy. Uh, we have seen in this most volatile world, every day there is something happening. There was COVID a couple of years ago, uh, there was a Ukraine war recently, now there's another uh, Middle East uh, kind of a flare up that has happened. Uh, tomorrow what happens in China and dead bubble burst, so nobody knows. So what you have to have is an agile policy. We saw all of us, nobody imagined that a uh, whole organization would be following work from home for two months, six months, that kind of a time. But uh, we were forced with that situation and people who dealt with it quickly, uh, they came back with solutions, were able to do business. Most of pe the people adopted uh, the online uh, kind of uh, approach and they did well. So you have to be resilient and then you have to be above the expectation. Uh, there is a very good framework that RBA has put in. There is what is the internal capital adequacy requirement for a lending business. So you have a capital adequacy requirement which is 15%. But what is the board recommending that should be a capital adequacy requirement over and above that? So that is what builds resilience because your shock will come. You should not go below the statutory level of uh, requirement. You should be above that. So I think those kind of policies uh, help you build resilience. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Said, for sharing your practical perspective and also un underlining that risk management should have agility and forward-looking approach. With that, we'll move to the next uh, theme. I'll, I'll go to Ms. Kalpana Jain. You know, in the previous in inauguration, people talked about the, the you know, capability and leadership in, in, the, in the board. So can you please comment upon what is the importance of talent and leadership 
the board. So I'm going to uh, talk about leadership and talent with a little bit of difference. Okay. So when I'm talking about leadership, I think the first principle is what is the future board going to look like? What are the constituents? Who are the kind of members, board members we are going to have into the future? Without exception, I think we've been talking about some of the challenges and some of the, let's say, uh, imperatives that board, boards are going to be facing as we move into the future. We talked about sustainability. We talked about, we didn't talk so much about digital, but uh, digital technology. Uh, we, we didn't talk so much about it, but cyber risk, which is, comes along with uh, digital and technology. Automation, which um, you mentioned, uh, Ellen, and uh, which again uh, will result in some jobs. I think, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, you mentioned that, that jobs will change. I would rather think that jobs will not go away, but jobs will change. So it may present uh, challenges of reskilling. It may present challenges of repackaging how people will deliver uh, at businesses. So all of this will lead into the kind of skill set and the kind of uh, subject matter expertise we need on boards. Hitherto, let's accept, at least here in this country, it's all, a lot been personality-driven. Board members were appointed because they were well-known or because you had friends or because they were family members. I think we have moved beyond that. We are beginning to move fairly beyond that. But going into the future, you will probably have a far more scientific, if I can use the word, approach to building boards in terms of who are on the board and how are uh, each one of them representative of what might be needed when one of these uncertain events hit us. We have seen so many uncertain events hit us. And for example, cyber, there's something that may not, every uh, current board member may not know. So either you have a role and responsibility for one of the board members to know it, or you have advisors in the interim, or you have some of your executive directors, for example, who could be you know, the experts who could bring such kind of expertise. Similarly, it'll apply to ESG. Similarly, it'll apply to the changing supply chains that are disrupted in an uncertain situation, for example. The readiness and the ability of the board and its constituent board members to address something we can't see, something that hasn't happened, I think is the central point. Equally so, I think it's the responsibility of the board and therefore the responsibility of the board members to track evolving trends to see how it will impact business. Uh, we didn't talk about generative AI. I think that is the topic which is very much on everybody's mind today, how it changes uh, our businesses, how it uh, you know, offers an opportunity to our businesses, and how it will disrupt the businesses, and therefore, what do we need to do about it? So on leadership at the board, that's my thought. On talent, I think what is clearly evolving, we've seen this happen globally, and we are seeing this happen here in India too, Talent itself wants to work with businesses with a purpose. So where we knit together the sustainability, the ESG imperatives, the ways of working, the future of work when we refer to how our young people want to work. They don't want to come into the office or to the factory. I mean, in the factory might need to, or to develop software sitting in the office environment. They are happy to do it in a hybrid model. So if we go back to our traditional ways of saying, no, everybody has to show up to work. We have seen what has happened in some of the organizations where mass resignations were seen. So it's not the role of the board to define uh, the work environment for uh, talent, but it is the role of the board to look at what's emerging and to look at what will drive the culture and encourage and support the executive in basically taking that forward. So to my mind, uh, talent used to be something which one didn't really work on or talk about on the board, but our boards today and our boards tomorrow will definitely need to address talent. After all, people work for people, people work with people, and unless uh, they are able to work together, business is not going to be generated. So some, some of those thoughts, I don't want to take up too much time, I can go on. I have a lot many thoughts, but perhaps in the interest of time. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and also the scientific way of lead, looking at leadership and talent in the board. With that, I'll move on to Dr. Kumar. And Dr. Kumar, in the earlier inauguration session, uh, Helen talked about sustainability and Dr. Sharma talked, talked about ESG. Again, this is an area very critical in how we navigate the future challenges. So what's your thoughts on this? 
सस्टेनेबल के नियम की गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन सस्टेनेबिलिटी इज ए आई वुड से नॉट ओनली ए बज वर्ड बट इट्स ए फैशनेबल टर्म एवरी वन टॉक्स अबाउट बिजनेस सस्टेनेबिलिटी एवरी वन टॉक्स अबाउट ई एस जी बट वट्स ए रियल पिक्चर लेट्स कम टू इट एवरी वन इज अवेयर दैट द बिगेस्ट चैलेंज विच दिस ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी इज फेसिंग इज दैट ऑफ द इनइक्वेलिटी सोशल इन इक्वेलिटी द अनदर चैलेंज इज द डिसरेप्शन विच हैज हैपेंड इन दिस वर्ल्ड and the biggest challenge is the climate change climate change driven extreme weather conditions which we see globally the global temperature has risen by about 1 degree celsius what is going to happen in the near future are we prepared for it when we say sustainability when we say esg when we talk about climate change in the g20 summit the theme was life lifestyle for protection of environment lifestyle that means the behavior change has to happen at the individual level at the family level at the level of the company at the level of the state and at the level of the central government that means we have to adopt while sitting at the board those practices those business practices which are sustainable are we prepared for it mr shiv kumar talked about we have listed companies which is highest in the world 5200 that means how many boards we have 5200 boards and how many boards are really professionally governed if you go to the state board state enterprises board most of the the boards have not been fully constituted i know it fully in case of the private sector there are so many companies where still the board members the so called independent directors are appointed by the controlling shareholder by the families but of course it is rooted through the nomination committee and board committees the board and everything is in place this is one aspect which we have to think about it if we say building future boards i will say it is wrong it is transforming the present boards of the companies how this is going to happen in the board most of you sit on the boards also the agenda paper runs into how many pages roughly on an average 200 pages and how many of us just go through all 200 pages this is the question which we have to ponder over mr shiv kumar pointed about it how many of us go prepared then go through the agenda of the boards sustainability is is it there on the agenda of the board how serious really the boards are about when it comes to the board meeting when it comes to the audit committee meeting the whole focus is on the quarterly results that is you know when we have this short term kind of phenomena it is ruining sustainability when we talk about sustainability it means sustainability of the business it means the sustainable profits the profits that can sustain in future this you know quarterly profit or quarterly financial performance is like a bubble that means we are ignoring the long term factors which are affecting the performance of the company we just neglect what is going to happen in the near future we do not have that kind of a vision while sitting at the board let me tell you that most of the major scams in this world have happened because of this short termism in case of lehman brothers the focus entirely was on the quarterly profits do you think it was sustainable it was not sustainable in case of satyam of course some kind of a scam happened what the board was doing it was the most professionally managed company in the world all who as who were there on the board was the krishna pelepu whom we have the greatest regard as the father of the corporate governance former cabinet secretary mr vinod dham the founder of pentium everyone was there on the board and no one could think what is happening at the level of the board mr raju was cooking the books 
there are certain things which must have been taken care of the company was sitting on a large pile of cash reserves did anyone ask questions what are you doing with the large cash reserves why not you use it if not in a position to use it why not to give it back to the shareholders because buyback is one of the options which is available in case of ilfs uh i think mr said talk about the risk management the risk management committee was in place the you know default started happening in september 2018 see what happened the risk management committee did not meet for the last 3 years so what to do with that risk management company another factors the debt equity ratio of ilfs was 16 times was it sustainable definitely not the current ratio which we say the ideal current ratio is 2 is to 1 that the current assets have to be two times of the current liabilities see what was the current ratio of ilfs when the default started happening it was 0.67 that means even the current assets were not adequate to meet the current liabilities was it sustainable definitely it was not sustainable so what is happening at the board is that we are just focusing on the quarterly results ignoring what is going to happen so the future board when we talk about it i think that we should look at the present board and we should look at the actual role with the present board of directors is performing in different companies more than 5000 listed companies and other unlisted companies there is no in case of unlisted companies you are very well aware that there is no standard of corporate governance in most of the unlisted companies so in that scenario can we talk about sustainability certainly not there has been lot of focus on the climate change we are signatory to paris agreement of 2015 where we are committed to have zero carbon emission by the year 2050 is it achievable what are doing on our end there are so many things which can be done for example i'll give certain tips in case of a transport companies transport industries how many of the transport companies have converted their transport vehicles into the evs how many boards have insisted upon it in case of banking and financial institution companies maybe that use of fossil fuel is not so relevant what is relevant is the misleading advertisement the misleading kind of marketing tactics which these companies some of the companies are following what are we doing sitting at the board is it sustainable and we talk about building of the future boards and the topic which is assigned to me is sustainability do you think that the boards are sustainable do you think that the companies are sustainable as i said in the beginning that our focus on the quarterly financial performance is like a bubble we ignore the long term performance of the company that what is going to happen in the near future how many boards talk about that what are the esg factors which we have followed during the year or what are we doing on this front it is never on the agenda of the boards except a few companies that to in case of 1000 top companies were aware that the as per the sebi mandate they have to issue the brsr and if you go into the brsr of most of the companies believe me it is copy and paste exercise just copy and paste exercise so are we serious about sustainability are we serious about the esg principles this we have to think about it unless and until at the top level we are serious about it we are committed about it i think that nothing is going to happen so these are some of the issues my initial thought i thought that i should share with you thank you very much thank you dr kumar for asking some relevant questions we should ask ourselves now moving to mr singh given the risk with risk management you have another speaker to speak on risk management again sharing his practical perspective so uh, thanks ajit and uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen 
Uh, I will build on to what Saeed said. Look, uh, um, we are living in a very volatile environment, and some of the previous speakers alluded to that. Uh, two simultaneous wars going on, uh, the tech disruption which is happening around us, uh, climate change, energy transition, these are some of the challenges which we are grappling with. So I think the, in that kind of environment, the need for risk management and effective risk management is very well established. And we did see during the pandemic that uh, boards and the senior management's focus on risk management, on resilience, on business continuity, on disaster recovery went up considerably. But I think that's not tapering off and we are, uh, you know, coming back to business as usual. And uh, uh, what we are actually seeing in the market is that, look, majority of the companies um, are not able to derive value from the risk management programs. And uh, uh, risk management programs, in most of the cases, they have become uh, a check-in-the-box exercise, right? And uh, uh, companies do that because there is a compliance requirement under the Companies Act or the listing agreement. You know, some of the... Uh, challenges which have happened, which Dr. Kumar alluded to, uh, do indicate our ineffective risk management procedures. And I think uh, one of the reasons why this is happening is that companies are uh, looking at just one aspect of risk management, which is, which is the threat part of it, you know, looking at risk as a threat. And they do ignore the opportunity part of the risk, right? You know, how can you use uh, your risk management function to build a competitive advantage in the marketplace, and particularly in a scenario where uh, disruptions are happening all around us. And uh, so I think that's something that you need to think about. And the second is that what we are seeing is that the implementation of the risk management processes is fairly patchy across companies. You know, who owns the process within the company is not very well defined. Uh, majority of the companies do not have a full-time chief risk officers. Uh, there is no common uh, language for identification and assessment of risk. There is no usage of technology. So I think these are some of the areas which we uh, need to think through. Uh, as we go about developing an effective risk management program for large corporations. And a uh, couple of elements which I thought I will touch upon, which, which we do, um, you know, discuss with the companies where we work for on the risk management agenda. Uh, look, uh, the risk management program has to be aligned with the corporate strategy. You know, you can't have a risk management program which is operating in silos. And uh, you can't have a strategy discussion without talking about the risks which the company faces and also the opportunity that lies ahead. So risk management and corporate strategy go hand in hand. And that is why in a lot of companies you would actually see risk management getting housed within the corporate strategy function. Uh, the second element is the executive sponsorship. So the risk management program has to be a board-driven, a senior management-driven agenda item. And uh, that sets the right tone at the top, and as a result, a better adoption of risk management processes across the organization. Uh, the third element is around governance. You know, so uh, the board needs to ensure that, uh, look, there is a, a person who commands respect within the company is running the uh, risk management function. There is a full-time CRO, and CRO uh, decides what is the objective of the risk management function, you know, how will success look like in terms of uh, reducing surprises. So that's extremely important. The fourth element is um, around risk appetite. You know, so I think that's again an area where board members and board can play a very important role, work with the management to determine what, is, what are the tolerance limits within which a company has to operate. And this includes both quantitative as well as qualitative elements. Uh, the fifth is uh, around the entire process of identifying risks and monitoring that, right? You know, so Typically, as board members, you can't look at everything which is happening in the company. So focus on risks which really matter. And typically, in any company, it can't be more than five to seven risks, right? And also, bring in the outside in perspective. You know, what is competition doing? What is happening in the external market? And how is that going to impact my company? Uh, that becomes extremely important. Uh, the other element which is very important is the whole risk culture aspect. I think uh, uh, Shiv did speak about that, you know. And there are a lot of tools available in the market which can help you do a risk culture assessment, you know, whether risk is embedded into the decision-making process and how wider organization looks at risk. So extremely important element. The last but not the least is technology. Uh, you know, look, uh, there are a lot of uh, GRC uh, tools which are available in the market which can help you uh, run your risk management process in a very optimal manner. And as board members, uh, you should encourage companies to adopt technology. You know, there are uh, data-driven, AI-driven technologies which can help you move from a, a reactive risk management to a more predictive risk management. So I think these are some of the areas 
uh, Sajid, uh, I thought um, uh, worth mentioning which US board members should uh, assess whether your companies are looking at and to build an effective risk management program. Thank you, Mr. Singh, for sharing your thoughts. And it would be useful to know that we should also look at risk from opportunity point of view rather than threat always as we do. And also the risk culture and looking at the gaps in risk management process is very useful. Thank you. Moving on to Dr. Sarin, uh, again, there is another important aspect is the stakeholder engagement and, you know, giving them the confidence and building the trust. So how do you think we can build the trust and maintain that engagement? Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I would like to start uh, with the, the Milton Friedman's uh, comments and his famous article in the New York Times in uh, 13 September 1970. And uh, that article was uh, seminal in the sense that the profit, uh, the social responsibility of business is making profits. And uh, that article, if you read it uh, thoroughly, it's a very solid article. And uh, it uh, had an impact on Wall Street for 50 years, and possibly now. And uh, once it had an impact on Wall Street, effectively across the capitalist world, it had an impact. And largely, if you look at it, uh, the boards and everyone is finally answerable to the shareholders and they're looking at their interests. But slowly as, uh, uh, you know, uh, we started uh, looking and as the uh, businesses evolved and management evolved, uh, people realized that uh, where is the balance? Where, is the, where are the other stakeholders? Where are the customers? Where are the employees? Where are you know, the regulators, are the companies taking care of those people also, you know? Because finally, you know, your employees who are there, they are serving your customers. They are the ones who are serving your customers. And if you have good employees, uh, competent employees, they will serve those customers. And uh, uh, those customers are the ones who are giving you business and they are giving you revenues. So finally, those revenues are coming, and uh, those once those revenues are coming, uh, the profits are flowing. So if you start uh, looking at uh, the entire chain, uh, and uh, yes, compliances are important, risks are important, your regulators are important. If you do a mistake now, like uh, the Volkswagen Group did, and they made profits, but then they paid a penalty much, much higher, you know, because of their uh, pollution problems, etc. You know, so all this is a balance. And uh, are, are we looking at stakeholders uh, in a balanced way? Or are we just looking one way, you know, and squeezing profits from quarter to quarter? And are the boards looking and balancing the long-term interests mm -hmm. or the short-term interests? And both, you know, because it is not that you just don't make any profits uh, quarterly and you just uh, focus on the long run only. but are you balancing? And uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, the stakeholder engagement uh, became important because it is important for profits finally, you know. Uh, and uh, because you, uh, you want long-term profits or you want short-term profits, if you want the company to sustain in the long run, you need to have those balances. You need to have competent employees. You need to hire. You need to pay them market salaries. You know, you need to invest in uh, technology. You need to invest in digitization. You, so all those investments are required. A lot of board has to guide about capital allocation, you know, and capital allocation over a long-term period. How, what, how will you burn the capital? So all those uh, things are important. And, uh, and that balancing uh, is uh, something uh, very critical. So all the stakeholders uh, in that sense, yes, possibly there may be a priority among the stakeholders. Uh, there may be a hierarchy among the stakeholders. You know, th those will all depend on the type of boards or the type of uh, companies or type of the context. But still, you know, one has to have a, have a full view. And uh, uh, as uh, a lot of discussion is happening on the composition of the board, and one thing I want to just uh, quote Peter Drucker, who said about Alfred Sloan, that in one of the meetings, uh, Alfred Sloan, uh, there was everyone agreed and Alfred Sloan uh, ended the meeting that he said that no one is disagreeing. You know, so there is no point of having a meeting, correct? And uh, uh, are, uh, are we like uh, 
appointing boards which are too comfortable, which are too cozy. And, uh, you know, even if they are going through a certain independent process, but uh, or are, as uh, Mr. Shiva Kumar pointed out, are the boards competent enough or rather, uh, you know, the right composition, not competent, but the right composition to bring in that value because you don't want an average board because you don't want an average output in your organization. If uh, many times I fee, uh, you know, I <coughs> think about companies like, for example, uh, you look at JP Infratech or you look at Unitech, where uh, possibly there were no independent boards or, uh, and uh, there was just one person who had the my way or the highway. And actually, uh, it, it would have helped that person itself, you know, someone would have put a control, someone would have put different views uh, into that uh, thing. When, uh, like for example, I represent IMT, and uh, when uh, I take out policies among my faculty members, and many people voice their views, and sometimes I joke that it is almost like any new policy is like uh, bringing a bill in the parliament. So much uh, in my own faculty is giving opinion. But many of my senior people say that, yes, that's fine, but then that enriches the entire process. You know, so if, if uh, the boards are one which are cozy, then possibly uh, they may not be the right uh, ones uh, in the sense that they should encourage a lot of debate and opinions. May, uh, of course, not disruptive opinions, of course, not unnecessary debate, but a lot of different point of views to enrich, uh, enrich and balance uh, the, you know, the, the kind of uh, organization that we want to have. So, uh, 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 particularly balancing between the long term and the short term, you know, and uh, balancing among the different, different stakeholders and communicating to them, you know, communicating to them on a regular basis and uh, 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 communi uh, uh, communicating could be a couple of types, you know, one could be essential, which is required as a part of a board or the other could be empathetic, you know, because you require to communicate uh, why you are making those decisions. You are, uh, the regulators may not ask you for that, but still uh, uh, you may like to communicate to your uh, stakeholders that uh, different, different decisions you are taking so that they, they build trust. And then also earnest communication that if there is a conflict of interest, if there are certain challenges they are facing, and in those challenges they're making decisions, are they communicating all those things? So uh, effectively, uh, that's uh, what I feel uh, uh, should be a right part of uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, engaging all the stakeholders in the right way is an essential part of our board. Thank you, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sareen, for highlighting the, the need for balancing between the different stakeholders and also the need for balancing long-term and short-term goals. We're getting great insights from the speakers, and besides economic challenge, we're also facing time challenge. I know we are running behind schedule, and I'm going to implement the advice given by them, previous speakers, the need for agility and adaptability. We, I had planned to ask more questions, but I'm going to change the plan, and probably open up for you know questions from you. And also, I'm managing risk because I don't want to stand between you and the dinner. <laughs> so, my own risk management. So, I just want to open for few questions from the audience. We'll take few questions and then the audience people are here you can network during the lunch, dinner and then you can have more questions while networking if it is okay with you we'll take few questions now yes please here please be very you know uh, brief Excuse and me? then tell yes. us whom you want okay. to whom, okay. to whom it is you know addressed my name is dr gurunath post doctoral department srinivas university mangalore karnataka on account of having public money and public policies imbalancing on account of this, how board can solve this problem? For example, state governments have given free transport facility to all women people. Now there is no business for transportation people. All those accounts become NPA for public banks and private banks and all in NBA fields. Now how board can act in a manner to see, satisfy all the people? How it is possible? Now it is are mushrooming the NPA accounts in the transport department. They are sanctioning free facility for all women transportation facility in state government. According to that, private people are not going to having any business in the transportation department. All those accounts become uh, turning to self-NPA made by the government policies. Government money, public money has to be recovered as a banker. 
bankers are the public are they are in a very dynamic position to see how board can act in a position to see either to direct the government to not possible or to go against it i think it's very difficult for i think the nominee directors of reserve bank of india or regulating agencies have to give very perfect report to the government authorities before implementing any policies or amending any policies it is very good in case of medicine they will go for medical trial like that they go for business trial or economic trial then only it is something we can prevent thank you sorry for thank you so much for sharing your thoughts thank you can i ask a question any you want to comment on this I am K N Mishra. Yes. Uh, I was with Tata Group of companies. Right now, I am Secretary General of Indian Tin Plate Manufacturers Association. Uh, all the panelists and the previous speakers have uh, very rightly explained about various things, particularly about risk management and all. Uh, since I come from basically a manufacturing company, I think. risk is right from availability of raw material to processing to packing to 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 uh, uh, marketing risk is also there for lending money risk is there for supplies so therefore uh, it should be regularly monitored and mitigated mitigation is very important so i thought you know mitigation of risk thank you and your uh, you want to come in here yeah. what do you think yeah no absolutely and i think look the um, uh, the value out of your erm program comes only because of the mitigation like right? it's not about listing the risks which are there it is about building strong mitigants so that you can reduce your overall risk Sorry. exposure and the success of the program lies that it is like a continuum right from uh, high risk you move to a medium risk to a low risk right that's how your risk profile changes if you have the right mitigation in place so absolutely agree with uh, what you said thank you and we can just I take just two more add on one point to this I, uh, that why the risk has increased uh, over time when we talk about companies this is sometimes done deliberately also the structuring of many companies have become so complex and the board of even the board fails to understand what is going on in the company there are so many companies where the size is very big and no one is aware that how the things are managed in case of ilfs no one was aware that how many subsidiaries ilfs group had in case of enron there were more than 100 spes and no one could able to understand what is the related party transactions between enron and special purpose entities the investors were thinking that risk has been diversified has been controlled but the fact of the matter was that risk remained with the company itself so sometimes what happens is that deliberately the structuring is made so complex the products through which the funds are raised are made so complex in case of lehman brothers also the complex kind of products were introduced that it becomes very difficult to recognize those risks so i think that if we have the conventional wisdom and try to make the business as simple as possible this is one of the possible answer which to my mind should be arrived at thank you very much thank you very much we can just take one more question because we are just running out of time yes please uh, i'm not addressing this to any specific uh, member of the panel but my question is general uh, what and we have seen many a times uh, promoter and organizations the board behaves very differently and uh, some of the challenges that come in a uh, promoter and organizations uh, you know that the board uh, manages to kind of get convinced by the promoter what's the view of the panel on that and there are enough stories about and enough information about promoter and organizations and the board that is being managed over there so what's the view yeah i think uh, the answer lies in how you are identifying your directors so i think if your directors are competent and people of stature i think uh, 
the, the probability of them getting influence easily is slightly lesser. If you're just filling a position of an independent director and you're doing it, maybe that's more of a possibility. So I think uh, the answer really lies in whom you're choosing your independent director is. And as many of the panelists and many of the other speakers said, if it's just a, a kind of a family member or a friend or something, then there is high likelihood of uh, compromising on that. So whom you choose is very important. Uh, that's what I think. You wanna add? Yeah. Just to add, uh, I think uh, companies with boards which are like self-serving, if I can use that term, have, they are at very high risk because really the role of the board is to be, you know, to provide guidance, to identify where things could go wrong and make sure those are corrected. So the highest risk are, I would think, are boards which are self-serving, where the promoters are driving what the decision-making should be. Thank you, Ms. Jain. Uh, yeah. uh, Ma'am, uh, to me, the things are changing now in the promoters' controlled companies. There was a time when board meeting used to happen only for 10, 15 minutes. And at that time, the minutes of the meeting used to be drafted by the company secretary and the directors were asked to sign on the dotted lines. Now, the meetings are structured. The agenda of the meeting is given in advance to the board members and a lot of discussions also take place in the board meeting. All the committees are in place, especially the audit committee. It has become very powerful also. All the financials are discussed with a discussion with the auditor also. So things are changing. The promoters, the family promoter groups have also recognized the importance of managing the company through a professional board. So I think that it's not so bad The things have changed in India also in other parts of the country. For example, in Malaysia, the companies used to be managed by families called chabols. Chabols are changing. In Japan, there used to be a structure called carrot juice, which used to manage the group of all the conglomerates. The carrot suits are also changing. The audit at that particular time even was not compulsory. Now the things are changing for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, please, yes, uh, be quick. Yes. I'm sure you find the whole you find the whole room pretty depressing when you talk about risk. Uh, in your region, is, is risk uh, taken with a bit of excitement? Uh, today's context? Um, well, I think you always have to view risk um, as an opportunity, for sure. Um, and that's the, the key. And I think it was mentioned before, but um, the risk appetite within the organizations and understanding what, what that is, um, is absolutely key to be able to do that with confidence. <laughs> um, and, you know, as ACCA, we do it ourselves. And there are some things um, that we absolutely will not compromise on. And there are other things we're very willing to take a risk. Uh, because, and that generally is where the future of the organization lies. So sorry I'm peeping strangely around this <laughs> <laughs> lectern. So um, I, don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's different between Europe and Asia or uh, Africa. I think that good boards and good organizations understand their risk appetite and they see risk as an opportunity. Thank you, Helen. And thank you all. Uh, given the time constraint, we have to bring to a close. And just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for being here, you know, sharing their insights and experience with us. I think we had a very good discussion today, and boards have got enough tips and advices to not only survive but thrive in these challenging times. Thank you all. Big, big round of applause for our speakers for a group photograph. I would request uh, Mr. Manoj Roth, CEO and Secretary General Institute Directors to kindly stay back uh, and propose the vote of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. To propose a vote of thanks before such a discerning audience is extremely special and a privilege. On behalf of IOD India, I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you uh, who have graciously participated in this special evening session here today. And 
This is an association we cherish it over the years, moreover, as a family. I am personally grateful to CEO Helen Brand for sparing her valuable time and to be among us. As always, she lights up the arena with her graceful participation and with an inspiring speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Helen, whenever she visits India, she gives us a special day for us and to spend time with our IOD family. We are extremely grateful to you. And these days, navigating challenges is quite a buzzword. word. I think we have been debating, deliberating at every platform. I want to express our sincere appreciation to all our distinct speakers for generously sharing their valuable insights, expertise, and enriching our knowledge, and also sparking thought-provoking discussions. My special thanks to Sajid Ji and Sandeep, um, who has been creating, making it all ready to host this beautiful session. And my sincere thanks also to my team, uh, board research and advisory wing, led by Sana, Lagima, and uh, Vershal, for putting together such a wonderful program here for all of us. My deep gratitude to all our IOD family members and guests for your enthusiastic participation and also contributing to the vibrant atmosphere of knowledge sharing and networking. I think as we focus on building future boards, resilient boards, strategic boards, there are three um, key focus areas, what I could conclude. We need to focus, and I think that will remain as a key priority for the boards for the rest of our financial year. Um, all about navigating challenges, geopolitical and economic conditions. And number two for the boards, the key priority will be rethinking capital allocation strategy to support the company's net zero ambitions. And third one, it's all about enacting sustainability transformation and corporate reporting. We are eagerly looking forward to your continued support in the future and hope to see you again um, at our upcoming event very soon. Our next annual global convention is in Mumbai at Hotel Taj Lens End that is on December 21st and 22nd, just before Christmas, which is just less than two months from now. And that is international, 18th International Conference on CSR. And this year, the theme is CSR and exploring evolution of ESG in the new world economy. And there, we are also going to felicitate the, the famed Golden Peacock Awards for CSR, HR Excellence, and Innovation Management during the convention. So thank you once again. And now dinner is ready. May I invite you all to join us for dinner. Have a nice evening. Thank you.